Hey, you sister students. Uh, this is our uh, second installment of our study of basically the uh, <clears throat> the New Deal time period with Great Depression. Hope you're doing well. And I want you guys to look at your screen. Feel free to pause. There's going to be a lot of background today, so feel free to pause it when you need to. Um, I'll pause a few minutes or a few moments to kind of let you take things down and then move forward. Okay. But I want you guys to think about where we left off last time. So we see this big transition from the presidency of Herbert Hoover to the presidency of uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt and his New Deal. And so Hoover is more of a, not exactly completely hands off, but certainly more laissez-faire than Roosevelt will be for sure. And I want you guys to think, how does FDR, which is a common expression for him, by the way, if you've not heard that, define the role of government? Well, this is going to be experimental. Um, this is going to be like willing to kind of go in different directions to kind of solve problems. If it's not broken, don't fix it. Well, America is kind of broken at this point, you could argue. So he wants America to be a lot more um, or the government, excuse me, to be a lot more active in solving a lot of these problems. OK, and so he takes office March 4th of 1933. By the way, he's the last president to take office on March 4th. And the first president eventually to take office on January 20th. And if you're kind of wondering why, guess what? You'll learn about that here in just a second. And so he's inaugurated. And if you've ever heard, like if you, uh, for those of you guys that have watched the recent election transition, et cetera. Okay. Just not to get too political on this, but just something to point out. You do have a lot of focus on the idea of that first hundred days. And a lot of that goes back to FDR. Guys, if you've ever heard the saying that he hits the ground running, that is pretty much a very a very common saying about Roosevelt. He does not waste time. He gives a very bold and also very aggressive agenda to our Congress. He's not going to be able to pass a lot of these things without congressional support. Yeah, he can do some executive orders, which he did. But for the most part, he also wants Congress to be able to support him, which in many cases they did. OK, and so what is going to be important about this inauguration? He makes probably one of the most famous statements in all of presidential inaugural history. And that is, he says that um, there is nothing to fear, but fear itself. I think a lot of you have probably heard of that before. Okay. So why would he say that? Guys, think about what's going on. He takes office, you know, that day, early March, 1933. And why is he going to say something like that? And a lot of that goes back to trying to generate that sense of confidence, right? People are in the dumps, right? A lot of them have lost their jobs. Unemployment is 25%. This is not really a good situation for the American public to be in, at least a lot of them. OK, so he also says, well, if you elect me, which America did, of course, we're going to actually end prohibition, which, by the way, he kept his word on that. But you also have to be able to amend the Constitution to formally, you know, end the 18th Amendment. And that's exactly what happens. Now, a lot of you are wondering, hopefully, why is there this Barrier Wine Revenue Act? And a lot of you might be wondering, well, Mr. Baker, you kind of made up that name. No, that is actually not a made up name. That is actually the name of the official act that kind of moves us in the direction of going back to producing alcohol, et cetera, before really the, uh, the formal 21st Amendment was added. OK, so the 21st Amendment will repeal the 18th. The 18th is the only amendment ever to be repealed in the history of the U.S. Constitution as of now. OK, and so I want you guys to think, all right, that amendment is 21st. Why haven't we talked about the 20th? Well, this is the reason why we're talking about it now. So if you think back to some presidents that have had some crises before, you know, to my mind, um, Abraham Lincoln comes to mind quite easily with the, uh, you know, the secession of the southern states and him kind of looking on the outside, on the outside looking in before his inauguration in March. There's been a lot of talk about why doesn't a president actually take office prior to this and even Congress. So they eventually were like, yeah, maybe it's time for us to move up the inauguration date of the president in Congress. And so they did. OK, so they moved it up from uh, March 4th. To January 20th for the presidency, and then Congress will be inaugurated on January 3rd. Now, I have a fun little visual to show you um, because a lot of times the 20th Amendment is called the lame duck amendment. All right. And it's kind of an interesting expression because what is a lame duck? Well, it's supposed to be a duck that is kind of injured or doesn't really do much because of whatever reason. OK, and so you might be wondering, well, Mr. Baker, why are you showing a showing us a picture of then President Obama with somebody dressed up in a duck? 
Well, evidently, I think this was the um, the October of ni- of 2016. So President Obama, of course, is in his uh, the latter part of his second term, so he can't run again. But they had a big Halloween party at the White House, or at least the um, the the uh, presidential area. And so this is, from what I understand, an eighth grader who was familiar with the 20th Amendment, we called the Lame Duck Amendment, and thought it would actually be, I guess, kind of a cool costume, kind of a cool, a cool setup or whatever. So that is his picture. I don't know the name of the kid. I don't know if it was ever even published out there, but that is the name of the kid actually using his understanding of that amendment, okay, to actually get his photo or his uh, time of the day, if you will, with the president. So anyway, I'm sure the president found that to be a little bit funny, um, knowing that, you know, the kid was familiar with the amendment. Okay. But FDR does really make a a very big splash in his first hundred days. Now, this is a slide that's worth guys stopping if you need to, and then we'll talk about it. Okay. So when we're talking about the New Deal of Roosevelt, we need to be able to categorize this into Roosevelt's three R's, relief, recovery, and reform. Okay, so what I want us to think about, guys, with relief, recovery, and reform, we're going to look at programs that fall under each one of these categories, okay? But there's a lot of abbreviations like the three R's, FDR, you've got you know abbreviations for certain programs we'll look at here in a second, okay? But the thing I want us to take the most note of here is relief is going to be mostly that direct relief that's going to help out the American people. So we're looking at jobs programs. Most of these are going to be short term. So what does that mean? It means that they're not meant to be long term. They're not meant to be people's lifelong, you know, livelihood. Um, I read a story, guys, with one of the programs we'll talk about in a second, where, you know, you maybe if you were, you know, working one of these jobs, maybe you make five bucks a month, maybe 10 or 20, not a ton of money. But it's something, right, to get people back on working. You know, a lot of these people were, were in, in many cases, not all, but certainly some young single men. So they didn't have families yet. So a lot of them were probably in their teens, early 20s. They had parents, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, younger siblings, perhaps. And they're going to be basically employed. But they're short term, most of them. There's a few exceptions here. OK, recovery. If you take a look here, guys, this is worth noting. This is where the business, bank, and economy is going to be the main focus, okay, of many of these recovery programs. And a lot of these things will be making their way into eventually reforms, okay? But that's a big thing to keep in mind. So these are medium term, right? Eventually, they'll in many cases be long term, but they weren't all set to be that up front, okay? So as we go through these programs, guys, on the next few slides... I want you to really ask yourself, categorize them by relief, recovery, or reform, and be able to understand how they affect certain areas of our society, whether it's people with jobs, whether it's the stock market, whether it's banking, you know, whatever it could be. Okay. All right. And then lastly, reform. I want you guys to think about what this is talking about. Stabilize American economic institutions. These are long-term in many cases. Many of these programs are still in effect today. We'll look at this more in a second, but guys, if all of you or many of you out there have bank accounts, you have stock market investments, et cetera, then it is very much true that your you know, economic involvement is pretty much affected by reform, even if you work a job that has minimum wage to it, all right, as we'll see here in just a second. Okay, so that's basically how we're looking at these. So these works projects, Take a look. You can pause if you need to. I'm not going to say a lot about all of them, but you can see Work Work Progress Administration, Public Works, PWA, CCC, CWA, Tennessee Valley Authority. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind. You're seeing a lot of abbreviations. Okay, so I'm going to make a suggestion for those of you guys that that write about these things. You incorporate evidence into your essays, etc. You always want to introduce a program by its full name. And then after that, you can put in parentheses the abbreviation, put here and after cited as. It's just a good way to show your readers and people that are basically looking at your work, if that applies, that you know the program and that you can also abbreviate it. Okay. Now, these are all, with one really big exception, relief. 
The only exception I would say is going to be the Tennessee Valley Authority. And the reason being is because the Tennessee Valley Authority is basically a, a system of, of what they call dam projects that were created in the Tennessee Valley. So this is going to affect Tennessee, parts of Western uh, North Carolina, parts of Georgia, parts of even Northern Alabama, et cetera. And what they were doing guys is that they researched this area and they found that there was a high percentage of poverty. In other words, people struggling. And they're like, well, we're living in an, a, a period now where, where there's a lot more dependence on electricity for, you know, inventions and, you know, technology. So what did they do? They started to build these projects to be able to make uh, electricity at a cheaper rate to more rural areas. And it, and it worked. It's still in effect today. You can actually Google it if you want. TBA.gov, I think it is. Okay. Um, the other ones, however, are more relief. Right. The CCC is probably the one that to me stands out the most. Um, for those of you that are uh, maybe young men working back then, um, especially let's say you're 17, 18, et cetera, it would not be that uncommon if you were, you know, out of, out of work or something that you would be uh, working for the CCC. They basically built a lot of projects that dealt with things like state parks, you know, things like that. So you saw a lot of these men that were actually working, you know, in pretty, you know, pretty tough circumstances as far as the work. It was hard, right? It was hard work. And again, most of these single people, uh, mostly young men, are not being paid a humongous wage. So what does that mean? It means that they're actually going, going to be sending a lot of that money back to their, their families. And it wasn't a ton, but it was enough to, one, give you some pride with working for a living, and secondly, to be able to give at least some support to your family. Okay, so that is that group of projects, guys, or programs are going to be known. Now, why do we also a lot of times guys need to know that these abbreviations are important? A lot of people actually refer to the FDR New Deal uh, and the programs as alphabet soup. And this is exactly the reason why, right? So we're seeing a lot of abbreviations being brought out, which I think is kind of interesting to think about. Okay. Same thing here, guys. Again, this slide actually has a couple of areas of New Deal reform. Okay. The first one is definitely going to be an example of eventually re, um, um, a reform. Why? Take a look, guys. You're talking about the idea of the banking sector. Guys, remember, some Americans went to the bank, said, hey, I need my money back. They didn't get a single dime back. The banks were not required to have what is called a required reserve ratio or the triple R factor. Okay. And why is that a problem? Well, guys, people lose confidence in banks. How do you bring it back? Well, an FDR's view makes some sense. You want to be able to have people that are going to put their money back, but they know that their money is secure, safe, and basically it's going to be you know, backed up. And this is exactly what the government is going to do. However, Congress is going to be on board with this as well. So they passed the Emergency Banking Relief Act. Okay. So essentially, guys, every so often you'll come across terms like bank holidays and things like that. Um, Basically, guys, what the Congress is going to say is, you know what, some of these banks are still operating, you know, at a, in a way that's that's basically effective, efficient. Um, others are not. So what they would do is they would say, OK, some banks are going to have to shut down. They're going to have to be inspected. It's almost like you're giving the banks a physical kind of like you and I get probably once a year. OK. And what happens is, guys, is that these inspectors would go into these banks and they would do exactly that. They would kind of test, you know, the solvency and the and the health of these banks. Um, did they have things in place that could basically, you know, provide support for their for their clients, et cetera? And guys, in some cases, the banks were able to reopen because they met the criteria of those inspections. And in other cases, they did not. Those banks, unfortunately, were in most in many cases going to be asked to close down. Now, how do you make people feel pretty secure about their deposits being uh, secured. And that's going to be where we call the Glass-Steagall Act. This creates what's called the FDIC. That stands for the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Okay, so another abbreviation here. What this particular abbreviation does is it basically makes it to where this program, I should say, guys, is that banks are required Credit unions have a very similar one. I think it's worded a little bit differently. But anyway, guys, lending institutions, banks, et cetera, they have to be.
be a part of something, either this or something like it. Okay. And it backs up your money in a certain bank up to a certain amount of money. Okay. Back then, I think they originally said an American that had $5,000 in the bank that the government or this organization or group guys, agency, excuse me, would actually back their money up until about $5,000. All right. Now that, that number is, I think the last time uh, we, we upgraded it, if I'm not mistaken, was in 2008, 2009-ish with the Great Recession getting started, okay, or at least uh, hitting us pretty hard. And I want to say, guys, that they upped it from 100000 to like 250000 Okay. So therefore, again, it gives Americans confidence that the government is going to be supporting their investments. And this actually is a pretty important thing. All right. Those of you that actually have banks that you go to, you know, maybe you don't go inside as often with the, uh, the drive up tail up tellers and things, but check on, you know, the front uh, windows. You're going to see a lot of these things put there. So it means something. Okay. All right. So remember what we said last time. So the farmer, what is the problem with the farmer? Well, there's a lot of things we could focus on, but one of them is low crop prices. Okay. So these farmers have not really adjusted their production to meet, you know, pre-World War I standards. At least a lot of them haven't. Therefore, their prices are low. Now, what is the, um, what is the FDR New Deal advocates? I would say this is a recovery. Okay, for sure. And they basically pass, Congress passes what's called the Agricultural Adjustment Act. All right. This is not the AAA that we associate, guys, with cars. Um, this is the AAA that we associate with the act that is going to affect our agricultural sector. So the question is, guys, how does it affect farmers? Well, this is where it gets to be a little bit controversial. Okay. So let's pretend that Mr. Baker owns 500 acres. All right. I farm wheat, corn, whatever it is. All right. And let's say the government is like, okay, well, we need to give you an incentive not to farm more. Why? Because, you know, you, your prices are going down. What's the ultimate goal, guys, with farm reform here? This might be worth noting. It is to stabilize crop prices. So in order to do that, guys, essentially the government is going to give these farmers kind of like incentives, right, to not farm a certain amount of their land. All right, so let's pretend that Mr. Baker is farming 500 acres. According to the AAA Act, right, or the Agricultural Adjustment Act, they say to me, okay, Baker, you know, you're not going to farm 250 acres, and the government is going to give you, you know, an incentive not to do that. That incentive is usually going to be some kind of money financial. Okay, now I want you to think, you know, some people are going to say, well, that's great. Prices will go up. You're basically adjusting your supply to basically meet demand, that kind of thing. Okay, but I want you to think, why would not everybody be on board with that? And what do you all think? And I would say, guys, that the biggest reason is it comes back to, to a large extent, economic freedom. Okay, people that own their own land, they own their own businesses. Some of them are going to be like, well, you know, we believe in, in complete or close, at least a strong degree of capitalism, minimal government involvement with telling us what to do through you know, are growing and things like that. Okay. Um, not everybody's going to agree with it. Now, keep in mind the U S Supreme court guys, if you go back to again, Barbara versus Madison back in the early 1800s, you know, the Supreme court does have the rightful authority to actually review any act of Congress. And they did, right. So they reviewed this act of Congress and they said, okay, we have, we have reason to think that this act is not constitutional. Now, Something for us to keep in mind with this is this. A lot of people are going to be thinking, guys, that this is an unconstitutional act that are on the U.S. Supreme Court. The, the U.S. Supreme Court actually shot down or ruled unconstitutional this first Agricultural Adjustment Act, amongst other things. Like the National Recovery Act was eventually deemed unconstitutional. Okay. And if you're FDR... You know, Congress within reason has been really, I think, cooperating with you. They've been passing laws, legislation, et cetera. And the Supreme Court is starting to basically rule against it. If you're FDR, why is that a concern? It's a concern because if they keep doing that, you might lose your new deal. Right. Which basically means that you're maybe not going to be reelected in 1936 
or 1940 or 44, right? So he's concerned, right? He's also concerned, guys, to give him a little bit of credit here, that his other concern is he's not going to be able to help out the people the way that he wants, right? So you got to give him a little bit of credit there, okay? So what happens? So he says, well, we're going to actually add more justices to the court. We call that court packing. And so the court had nine, and he says, okay, we're going to make it 15. Now, why would he do that? Guys, remember, those of you that maybe aren't familiar with this, it's new. Who appoints new judge, uh, justices? The president does. And who confirms them? It's going to be the Senate of the United States. Okay. Now, this is tough because FDR wants to really be able to have his stamp on the court like this. However, the Congress does not agree, right? And the Congress steps in and they say, okay, no, you know, we've been supportive of you and we're going to continue to do so as best we can. But they say, okay, we cannot agree overall, okay, with the idea of allowing you this much power to actually put six more justices on the bench. And so, you know, they, they, I think there's a lot of arguments here, but one of which is, you know, they see this as a violation of, you know, checks and balances, separation of powers, et cetera. Okay. And so he does not get his way. Now, a lot of you are thinking, okay, well, Mr. Baker, there's a second agricultural adjustment act that was passed later. Does that one actually stick? And the answer is yes. And the reason being guys is because a lot of these older, more conservative justices, what do they start to do? They start to step down, you know, and what does FDR do? He replaces them with more progressive and new deal supporting judges. So, or justice, pardon me. So as a result, what happens, the agricultural, the second agricultural, uh, agricultural adjustment act is in fact going to be eventually passed and upheld in the U S Supreme court. Okay. So again, it is controversial for several reasons, but he does not get his way with court packing, but he tried. Okay. Um, as far as guys, a couple other areas of the, of the, uh, the FDR new deal, we'll look at the, the social security system a little bit more, uh, our next time. Okay. Since that's one that a lot of students are pretty interested in and also requires a little bit more detail. Okay. You notice guys that we've talked about the banking. We've talked about the jobs with relief. We've talked about the idea of helping farmers with recovery. Okay. What's the one area of the cause of the great depression that has not been really addressed in large detail. It's going to be the effects of the stock market. Okay. So that's where the securities and exchange commission comes into it. So the sec. Okay. This is definitely a reform. Why? Because it creates a, a system of stabilizing Again, guys, people lost a lot of their investments. They lost a ton of money in the stock market crash. Okay. You're not going to be able to get them to have more confidence if you don't give them some degree of support. Now, what the SEC does, you can go to sec.gov, I believe is a website address, guys. Um, there's a lot of neat information there. What I would encourage you all to do, if you have a few minutes, is to go and kind of browse it. But essentially, guys, what you'll find is that there's a lot more information about investing. Um, the stock, the buying stocks on margin is not really something that, uh, that I think you can do the same way that you did back then. Okay. So it puts a lot of regulation, okay, on the stock market, similar to the regulations on banks, right? Okay. And, you know, if you have money in the stock market, Guys, you're probably familiar with the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Okay. You know, that's something that, that has been around before this. But again, I mean, those of you that have smartphone technology, you know, you can go and look at just about anything, you know, you know, up to date, up to the second, you know, until what is it like 4 p.m. Eastern Standard, Eastern Standard Time. And you know, you know how much your stocks are worth, what the Dow is, how much, it's, excuse me, grown, how much it's lost that day. Um, we're obviously in a very digital age to benefit, but that's what one of the things that the SEC does. It regulates a lot of the activity. Okay. You'll also notice guys, as far as like a few other details, just really quick, as far as home ownership, um, the HOLC, the Federal Housing Administration, those are both um, agencies that were created 
to pretty much address things like low interest loans for farmers and you know, basic homeowners and things like that. Okay. If you've ever heard of like um, you know, certain loan programs that are through these, you can actually look into those if you're looking to buy a house. Okay. And then also guys, even like just to throw this in there as an example, there's a lot, guys, this is the tip of the iceberg with the, the new deal, but just to give you a little bit of perspective on it. Um, preservation of Native American culture. So again, in the early 30s, they're going to see it as an important thing to try to further support that particular thing. Okay. Last but not least is the business and labor sector. Okay. So the big thing, guys, with the National Recovery Administration or Act, which again was deemed unconstitutional um, by the court at one point, is the idea of, again, trying to put restrictions or at least um, regulations on trying to help these businesses kind of bounce back, so to speak. Okay, so very important to keep in mind. And then, guys, what about that of labor? The Wagner Act is pretty important. Okay, so what does this do? It basically gives more power to the labor unions. Okay, so the unions are going to have an, a, an officially recognized um, opportunity to have protection with what's called um, the uh, the right to collectively bargain. The government in this act officially recognizes the right of unions to do this. Now, keep in mind, all all states are not union states. Okay, but if you're coming across like you know things like if you know not to get political on this, but if you're listening to the news like the Chicago teacher situation right now, etc. Okay, guys, all of those teachers that are members of unions, they all have agreements, right? They all have these collective bargaining agreements for a certain amount of time that basically recognizes the rights of workers. And that's pretty much what this act is doing. It's acknowledging the right of those unions to collectively bargain, you know, so that they can negotiate wages, they can negotiate workplace safety conditions. Okay. The list goes on and on. Okay. And then what about things that go beyond, you know, just um, those basic things? They also pass what's called the, the Fair Labor Standards Act. Okay. So this is not really something, guys, that you've not heard of as far as the basic ideas. Okay. Minimum wage laws, right? So, you know, what is it now? Minimum wage is in the, the 725 range, I think it is, something like that. Okay. Back in 1991, when I was 16, getting my first job, it was 425. So that goes up. Okay. Okay. Um, Obviously, we hear a lot of talk about it now with increasing it, et cetera. Okay. But before then, to my knowledge, there was not really a required federal minimum wage. Now, keep in mind, just a real quick note, guys, states do have the ability to raise it, but they cannot lower it below the federal minimum. Okay. So if you go to a state like California or New York or somewhere that has a higher standard of living, Okay, you might find that those states have raised it, but nonetheless, there is a federal minimum that pretty much has to be adhered to. Okay, all right, 40 hour uh, work week with overtime pay. So pretty much you work 45 hours, you get time and a half. Okay, it's kind of a big deal. I remember my first job, they just opened a brand new grocery store in Southern Ohio at the time called Big Bear. Uh, it was a chain, I don't think it exists any longer. But they just opened it. And they're like, all right, you're going to work six, eight hour days. And man, when I got that paycheck at the end of my week, I was like, man, this is pretty cool, right? Because I got a time and a half. Um, they did take more tax out of it. So that did change things. Okay. Anyway, and then also child labor restrictions. Okay. So we're not going to say a lot, guys, about this, but just keep in mind um, that unions will gain some, uh, some, shall we say, support. Um, you're going to see the continued uh, rise of the AFL. They're going to eventually merge with the Congress. I'm sorry, Committee of, of Industrial Organizations. Okay. So again, they combine strength in numbers or whatever. You're going to see the rise of the United Auto Workers. I put that in there for my brother since he works at Ford Motor Company. Okay. And so what do we notice, guys? The government, again, is getting more involved in protecting business. Guys, remember the Gilded Age. Just a quick note on this. You know, you don't really have a lot of support for for um, for work, excuse me. OK, the same way that you will during the FDR New Deal with some of these acts and policies and things. 
Okay. So we will pick up next time with our study of the Social Security Act and our big focus. Our big focus will also be on the idea of criticisms of FDR's New Deal. Why would he have critics, right, when he had this ambitious set of goals? And the answer is we'll see next time. Have a good one. Feel free to email me at bakerd.franklincommy.org with any of your questions. And I'll be more than happy to answer them and get back to you. Thank you. Have a good day. Stay safe. Bye.